So from an overperforming to an underperforming defense, the Chiefs' defense has really been abysmal this year so far, and they're only 2-2, two and two, and now there's actual competition in that, in that division now. Do you think that is a legitimate concern for them as a championship competitive team? Yeah, it has to be. I don't know that it's an Achilles heel because we have seen that team without great defensive play go to the AFC title game and to the Super Bowl because of Patrick Mahomes and that offense. The offense thus far has had a couple of issues, but you expect those things to be ironed out. It's still one of the most talented offenses in the NFL. They have the best quarterback in the NFL and probably the the best play designer in Andy Reid. Those combination of things, especially given how long all those elements have been together, makes you believe that they're going to get right back to where they need to be. And if you have that kind of offense, you can win with a mediocre defense. Now, the defense has to get back to mediocre to your point it hasn't gotten to that point thus far through four weeks but you know four week sample size is very small defenses in some cases take even like half of a season to figure themselves out and with that defensive staff it's a very veteran staff they have been able to adjust over the course of the season before we saw that in the year they won the super bowl where they started off kind of slow then chris jones started to catch fire they started to use things with him you know stunts they started to play around with those coverages they played a little more quarters as opposed to cover three when you do those sort of adjustments and they'll have different adjustments this year because it's different every season but when you have a staff that's capable and willing to make those adjustments and you have the talent that they have you can expect it to improve. I don't know how much of an improvement is, is is on the table for them, but I would expect if health provides, they are going to be better. Now moving on to some college football, which a lot of people are not surprised that Georgia is a top three team right now in the nation. Alabama has played good football. Even Arkansas has looked really, really good. Is there has there been any been has there been any surprises so far early in the college football season? It's not that Georgia's undefeated. It's the caliber of that defense. And they had a good defense before. It's not like that part of it is total shock, but this might be, through four or through five weeks, the best college defense of the 21st century. Statistically, it is. Now, small sample size, you always have to throw that caveat out, but it is playing so well that Arkansas, which had been playing very well itself, was basically a persona non grata throughout that recent game. So, That defense is capable of taking over any game, including their upcoming matchups with the Alabama Crimson Tide, and when they're going to play later on in the SEC, in the SEC title game, in the college football playoff. That is how good that defense has shown itself to be. The offense does not have to be great, and it probably won't be. You know, they've already had issues with JT Daniels staying healthy. That was an issue for him at USC. It's been an issue with him thus far at Georgia. But they don't have to have a great offense. They don't have to have George Pickens come back for that offense to be good enough. They just need that offense to be, you know, SEC average, which is, you know, still better than national average, but it's not otherworldly. That that's all they really need in order to balance what they have on that defense. So another team that could crack into the top four, being that Iowa and Penn State play each other this week, is Cincinnati. Undefeated right now, looking very complete all-around team. Another team with a great defense. Do you think Do you think they are legitimately college football playoff team? And do you think they have to go undefeated and dominate in every game in order to do so? And also, if there's any game that you think they could lose, what do you think it would be? Well, they're definitely college football worthy. I thought they were worthy last year. Now, they weren't going to make it in because that's just the politics of the college football playoff system. But they were good enough to compete if they made one of those four spots last year. This year's team is even a little bit better than that. And now they've beaten Notre Dame at Notre Dame. If they go undefeated, unless Notre Dame just completely craters over the course of the rest of the season, they are going to get in. Because you just look at how the chessboard has is played out for them. You know, there is not an undefeated team left in the Pac-12 that has a shot at the college football playoff. The Big Ten has a few teams, but Ohio State already has a loss. As you already noted, Iowa and Penn State are going to play each other. One of those teams is going to have a loss. And even though the other one could still make it in with undefeated record, that itself is not a guarantee. The SEC could produce two. That could be Georgia and Alabama, as we were just describing earlier. But then that leaves another spot. The ACC is probably not going to produce a team The Big 12 could, but that's a little more precarious now than it appeared at the beginning of the season. You throw all those things in together, and undefeated Cincinnati has a really good case because they've already shown it for a full season in 2020. They've continued on in 2021. They look even better, and they already have that that big win. Now, to your last part of your question, what could trip them up? The only real game that I think 
could provide a real scare is SMU. Now, that game is at Cincinnati. That's going to really help them, obviously. But that offense with Sonny Dykes is capable of giving anybody trouble. I don't know if that's going to be enough because that Cincinnati defense is so good. But if it's going to be somebody on the regular season schedule, that's my best guess. We are talking to award-winning SB Nation, NFL, and college football writer Jason Hershorn. Now, Jason, are you surprised that Jim Harbaugh – and I've been talking about Jim Harbaugh getting fired at the end of the season. He was going to go to the NFL. I I didn't think that he was going to start 5-0. This defense has played a lot better than we imagined it to be. Over the last couple of years, this is the best start that Jim Harbaugh has had since he's taken over the team. Do you think that this team is playoff bound? I'm not ready to go there. It doesn't mean that they can't. I mean, they definitely have that ability. That said, they, you know, there's just enough of hesitation with that offense. You know, McNamara might be the best of the recent Michigan quarterbacks. I don't know that he's transcendent, and he probably has to be for that team to really make a playoff run. You know, he could improve. Obviously, his first year as a starter, so there is room to grow there, but you, you need to see it before you believe it because Michigan has shown this kind of potential before under Jim Harbaugh and, you know, falling apart down the stretch or, you know, when that Ohio State game came around, it, it finally, you know, the, the, all those roosters came home to roost. So I, I just, I, I need to see it. Jim Harbaugh has validated them bringing him back. I think we can say that at this point, but saying that they're college football playoff bound is just, it's a bridge too far for me right now. So talks have been coming out with the expansion with the SEC, Texas and Oklahoma, obviously moving there in the next couple of years. And also the alliance with the ACC, uh, the, the, big, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 now. So how do you think that's going to change the overall landscape of college football when it comes to scheduling, when it comes to recruiting and and just any other concept in general. Well, it's been treated like a flashpoint, and to a certain degree it is, but some version of this was always likely to happen at some point, even if it didn't involve the SEC. If Texas and or Oklahoma decided they were going to leave the Big 12, every other power conference was going to make a play. You know, it just happened to be that the SEC got them. You know, it's not like the Big 10 was not going to go after those teams if they were allowed to. Remember the Pac-10, back when it was the Pac-10, mm-hmm made a run at Texas about a decade ago. So this thing was always going to happen because the Big 12, even though it's had some better years of late, it's always been on financially precarious grounds by the standards of the Power Five. And the SEC has obviously grown the pie for them in terms of their TV money. The Big 10 has done that. The Pac-12 hasn't, and that could eventually become a concern for them. That's why there's been such a big push. You know, they, they changed commissioners this year. That was almost entirely predicated on that TV money with the Pac-12 networks not bringing in what they were expected to. You know, there's going to be more change. This isn't the final domino to fall. You know, I don't know if that means that these conferences are going to combine. The alliance is kind of this, you know, soft, precarious thing. We, we don't know what that's really going to look like or if it's even going to make a difference at all. You know, for legal reasons, they can't even call it a binding agreement. So we don't exactly know how it's going to play out, but there's going to be more of this sort of condensing at the top because that's where the money is. You know, a lot of these big teams are going to decide, like, why are we floating these smaller teams in their conference? And by the way, this that includes the SEC. At a certain point, if they continue at this pace where they're going to focus on the biggest teams available in college football, you know, they're going to decide, you know, why do we need Vanderbilt when they're not providing us with money? Now, I don't think it's the way that college football should go. I think that long term is bad for the health of the sport. But we've seen that short term money guides these decisions. So until we see tangible change from the leadership of the big conferences and from the NCAA to the degree that they even have leadership at this point, you have to assume that. That's the direction it's going to go. One more question for me with college football. Do you like this new rule? That with And I, I, I love that these players are making money now. Were you surprised that the NCAA accepted this deal where players can make money off their own name? And if so, uh, were you surprised with some of the money that some of these players are making right now? Obviously, the quarterback from Alabama is making over a million dollars. He hasn't even stepped he, – he didn't even step on the field and he's making over a million dollars. Are you surprised that these players are making this kind of money? And if so, do you think that this will change the sport for the better? Let's start out with this. This isn't the NCAA's choice. The NCAA did not want this to happen. The legal system forced this decision, to such such a degree it was a decision, upon them. You know, the NCAA was hoping they would get a more lenient judgment 
at the Supreme Court level. That was not going to happen, even with this Supreme Court, simply because the gears have been in motion for this for a long time. It is really hard to argue to a legal panel of any variety that you know, fixing prices is actually a feature and not a bug. And you as an organization should be above those, those practices because that's the law. You know, this is a labor force, no matter how the NCAA wants to categorize it. So even though it took a long time to get here, this was an inevitability. Now, in terms of, is it going to change the sport? I don't really know that it is because what really is the dynamic of this money? It is incentivizing players to go to the biggest programs they can. Well, they were already incentivized to do that, right? Like <laughs> yeah, Alabama true. and Georgia and Clemson and all those big schools were always going to get the biggest recruits. Now, every now and then you'll have a school that sort of comes out of that second tier, gets a big recruit. You know, that, that will still happen. There will be players that decide they want to value something above the money. It doesn't mean they're not going to get money, but they might decide, hey, you know, I'm from, you know, this part of the country. I'd like to stay in that part of the country, even if it's not the biggest football program. So you're still going to get some of that. But I think this is really reinforcing the existing dynamics. I don't think it's really changing anything. The big change, if and when it comes, is when the schools themselves pay the players, as opposed to just the NCAA not penalizing players for getting paid by third parties. Now, I don't know when that's going to happen. You can't even necessarily say, necessarily say at this point that it is going to happen. But that is, a, that is definitely a possibility because, again, this is a labor force. You know, they have the ability to unionize, at least in some places, when it does happen, and eventually it is going to happen, that's going to force change across college football. Because let's, let's say like a private school is able to pay the players directly. Well, the public schools are eventually going to get on board because they don't want to lose out on the big recruits. And the NCAA has basically abdicated their responsibility in this particular area. So at a certain point, that could happen. I don't know what form that exactly will take because there's a lot of other considerations, Title IX, uh, uh, certainly tax considerations, which is already a concern with some of these uh, these deals. But all which to say is I don't know that we've seen a big fundamental fundamental change. Players are still going to go to the biggest programs if they can. They're still going to want to do what they can to get to the NFL because for the vast, vast majority of those athletes, that is the goal. One more for me. It's very simple. College football playoff expansion. Are you for it? And if so, how many teams would be best and why? I guess I'm for it, but in a very limited sense. Uh, I'm someone who doesn't necessarily care as much if the best team, or at least what we think to be the best team, wins the championship. I like chaos. I think that's the best feature of college football. Absolutely. Like 2000, yeah. the, the 2007 season will probably be the most fun college football season we will ever get because of all the change at the top. And with, with every move towards a formalized playoff or an expanded formalized playoff, we lose a little bit of that possibility. And, and that's just sad for me because, you know, college football, the more it becomes like the NFL, the less unique it's going to look, the less fun it is going to be. Not that the NFL isn't fun, but you like that it's different. At least I like that it's different, that it has these characteristics. And I think the larger the college football playoff becomes – the more those other characteristics are put in, pushed in the background, because since the college football playoff came into existence from the first week of the season, or even from week zero, as they now call it, we're only talking about the college football playoff. We're not talking about the bowl games outside of that. We're not even talking about the surprise teams that don't have a real shot at the college football playoff. We're just talking about you know the the 15 or 10 or whatever teams that appear to have a shot at the college football playoff. You, know, you can expand it, and I guess more teams will have access to it simply by the matter of the math, but... It's still going to become a hunt for the playoff more and more and more than it is anything else. And I think college football is going to lose an important piece of itself in that transition. Jason, mm. thank you for joining us. You, you were awesome. Gave us some good information, not only with the NFL, with college football. Um, I see that you're award winning. Uh, what, did you, what did you just win uh, for, for, for an award? Well, I'm a member of the Pro Football Writers of America. And Congratulations. I won Congratulations. one of their awards for feature writing. Uh, it, it remains the highlight of my career because <laughs> usually the people who win those awards have been in the industry for longer than I've been an adult. So to, to have won an award and to have seen my name uh, in the same space as all of these great and talented sports writers meant a lot to me, and I will cherish it for long. Oh, congratulations, congratulations man. You deserve it, absolutely.